I'm Maida Owens with the Louisiana Division of the Arts Folk Life Program. Um, with me today from the division is Kelsey McCrary. She's going to be helping me with the um, with the logistics and reminding me to do what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> we also have our new executive director, uh, Susanna um, Johansson, uh, with us. Uh, she's been on, uh, with us for two months now, and welcome. Uh, we have a wonderful panel uh, scheduled for y'all. Um, I wanna give you a little bit of background about the Bayou Culture Collaborative and then turn it over to our moderator for today, uh, Jeffrey Darensburg. Uh, if you didn't attend our first uh, public series in this series of, um, of workshops, uh, it was uh, climate change, migration and sustaining Louisiana's culture. And the link is in the chat if you, if you missed it. And it gives a good introduction to some of the issues, goes into some of the research and such. Um, and Louisiana's response, uh, the Division of the Arts response and such. So I encourage you to watch that if you didn't see it. Um, I, um, today we're going to focus in on uh, the role of the artist and arts organizations. And oh, while there's much to be done, I want to acknowledge that there really has been some amazing uh, work by artists and arts organizations in the state and it's continuing. Um, and we've invited uh, some of those that are most active, but I assure you there are many others uh, that have been doing this type of work. Um, if you're not familiar with what's going on the coast, you must have been living under a rock uh, or a mud pile. <laughs> Um, but this really is a statewide issue. A lot of people think of it as a coastal issue and it's not, it's a statewide issue. And uh, as pointed out in the last workshop, uh, North Louisiana has its own climate change environmental issues with the uh, droughts um, and extreme preci precipitation that's been going on there. So, um, but this is a statewide issue and I truly believe that artists and arts organizations have a special role in helping communities understand what's going on and how they can participate. Artists have an, a unique way of being able to reach people that uh, reports and, and um, conferences simply don't um, uh, address fully. So today, um, Jeffrey Darensborg is gonna guide uh, us through a discussion about uh, the artists and arts, arts organizations. Jeffrey has a PhD from the uh, University of Louisiana, Louisiana at Lafayette. He is a member of the Atakapaw Ishak Nation and a native of uh, Baton Rouge, uh, Point Capi in Baton Rouge and Lafayette. He's lived uh, quite a number of places across South Louisiana. He's currently a fellow at the Center for Louisiana Studies at UL Lafayette. And uh, so he's going to take you through some, to explore some issues. And so I turn it over to Jeffrey. Uh, sorry, I had forgotten to unmute. Uh, thank you very much, Maida. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this meeting. And I'm really happy to be here with some fascinating people, Amy Rogan, Sam Oliver, and Brendan Belanger, uh, all people who work in the arts. Uh, Sam is from the Acadiana Center of the Arts, for the Arts. Uh, Brendan is a working artist uh, out of Arnoville, Louisiana. And Aime is director at a studio in the woods, which is Tulane's arts campus on the West Bank of Orleans Parish. Brendan and I have both been residents at a studio in the woods. Uh, we uh, were both there at the beginning of the pandemic, so I'm especially happy to see him again. And thanks to all of you, and thank you, Maida, for wanting to address this issue, which is an issue that many of us who 
work in the arts uh, think about uh, quite often. So maybe it's just as a general question uh, for the three of you, um, Sam, Brandon, and Amy, just in general, how does the state of the world influence your work in the arts? Or what is your general approach to integrating social issues into what you do? Brandon, how about I start with you? And don't forget to unmute. If you, any of you have questions, uh, please mute your microphones. But if you have questions, you can drop them in the chat. And we will get to them uh, in due time. Brendan? Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, uh, really, it's the, it's the impetus and motivation and, and, and strong inspiration to, to try to tell the story of, of being a human being at this moment in history facing you know, a, a mass extinction crisis, as well as increasing climate crisis, and uh, increasingly trying to think of ways that uh, through art science and and activating communities, we might be able to, uh, you know, save other species and and perhaps ourselves along the way. Mm. Amy. Hi everyone. Thanks, Jeffrey and Maida. Um, I would say, I mean, yeah, this is the question we live with uh, at Studio in the Woods kind of all the time um, because we view, uh, you know, our place as a place to in, inspire and uh, foster kind of artists and scholarly reactions to the challenges of our time. So this is precisely the space we live in. I would say... I mean, as a, as a native Louisianian and New Orleanian, um, for me personally, uh, supporting artists and our communities to really uh, address vision lead uh, ourselves and the rest of the country and possibly the world. <laughs> on these topics is really like where I live. And at the same time, like Brandon said, like save this place in the process. So that's uh, micro to macro. And I guess my short answer is yes, we think about that all the time. How can we create conditions for artists and scholars and thinkers to thrive in this time? All right, uh, and Amy, uh, I, I guess, uh, you had some slides and let's begin with those. I think Sam's, uh, is Sam back on or has? I'm back, sorry. Oh, okay, Sam, would you like to take a shot at that uh, question? Namely, uh, how does the state of the world influence your work in the arts and what is your approach to integrating social issues into the arts? I mean, I think the state of the world for me, one of the reasons that I work in the arts at all is the state of the world, especially in kind of small tight-knit community spaces and how the arts are especially transformative uh, in close communities, how they can kind of open up a knot that sometimes is tied really tight or that can connect people together that otherwise are really dispersed. Uh, and obviously we see how uh, communities can be so vastly impacted by social issues on any scale, uh, global, local, et cetera and how that can have either a really polluting effect or sometimes a really positive and transformational effect. Uh, but I think at the local scale, arts and, uh, and the cultural space is how we actually connect with one another in a human scale. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for that answer, Sam. I like that very much. Um, Amy, you had brought some slides with you. Uh, could we maybe start by showing those? And Yes. Somewhere. I think there's a video in there. Maybe talk to people a little bit about what Studio in the Woods and sort of is and sort of what you do there. Yeah, certainly. Um, so for those of you that don't know, we are um, a program, as was mentioned, of Tulane University of their Bywater Institute. And we're located on eight acres 
of carefully preserved bottomland hardwood forest, um, which is located on the west bank of the Mississippi River. So we're downriver from what people think of as New Orleans slash Bulbancha, and but we are still technically in the parish. Our, our founders purchased the fallow sugar cane, plant, sugar cane plantation about 50 years ago in 1969. And over the years, they sought to protect the forest, not only for its value as a wetlands, but as a powerful source of creative inspiration um, and education. They were both our founders, Joan Lucy and Carmichael, were um, very involved, deeply involved in public education. Uh, fun fact, Joe Carmichael was the first lobbyist for public education in the state of Louisiana. And so they were very devoted to this and retired and built their um, homestead and their studios and then formed the nonprofit, a studio in the woods in 2001. Um, we have uh, a program of active forest preservation. We have a botanist on our staff who manages and researches the forest and has done so since 2004. And we've had a number of stressors to that forest since that time. Sorry, 2004. We also provide science-inspired art education through a summer camp. We have a festival in November, November 13th this year and school partnerships. But at the core of our programming is providing a protected peaceful retreat for artists and scholars. So you can move on to the next slide. So this shows some of our compound, little thumbnails from our website of some of our compound. Um, we, most of the spaces are made of recycled, uh, built out of recycled materials, except for our newest space, the writer's cabin, which we just completed. Um, in late 2019, and um, we now can host up to three artists at a time. And so since in our 20 year programmatic history, we've hosted more than 150 artists and scholars from all disciplines um, into mostly competitively selective residencies throughout the year. Uh, residents are granted one to six weeks of staff supported creative work time, room and board, along with a generous stipend and materials budget. The majority of our residencies are thematic and they often respond to current events and are grounded for us in the interplay between art and science, between humans and the natural world. It's important to us that the work in a residency have an impact in our city and our region and our state. And to this end, artists who apply must propose a self-described significant community engagement component. We have staff who facilitate this engagement and link residents to our local schools, environmental nonprofits, neighborhoods, individuals who can partner in the process and also in the presentation of work. We love to partner with presenting organizations, winking at you, uh, Katie Ann Art Center. And um, every year we see a significant increase in applications, which indicates this to us that artists are eager to engage on topics of um, environmental and social issues that we, uh, that we support. And we've really seen an increase in applications from local and regional artists. And I say this to this art audience in particular, because we interpret that as evidence of ownership and expertise of the issues informed by the lived experiences of what we're facing in South Louisiana. So when I said before, I really feel very strongly that we know something here that is of value to humanity. And um, so I like, like to say that as much as I can, because I don't know that we always take ourselves seriously here in Louisiana um, on all issues. So, um, so whether from New Orleans or the U.S. or other countries in which these are, each of these artists have been provided time, space, support, and a stipend for the creation of new work. And we can move to the next and then we'll get to a slide, uh, sorry, a video. But I wanted to, these are covers from some of the catalogs from our previous series. Um, prior to Katrina, we were offering space to artists who applied and it was Katrina that really pointed to us, um, post Katrina rather, and what we saw as the extreme challenges to our community, to, to artists, to the land and we, um, formed a series of residencies called restoration residencies. And since that time, we have done uh, three-year cycles of residencies addressing um, environmental and social themes. 
Um, many of those have been in responses to catastrophic environmental events. So it's not just Hurricane Katrina, as we know, Deepwater Horizon spill, um, you know, the crises, ongoing flooding, um, there are changing land, the way that the land moves beneath our feet, the water rises. Um, we most recently completed a series um, called Adaptations, Living with Change. And, you know, we, we really have been driven by a collective community need to have artists help us lament and rage and understand and ultimately find hope after each of these crises. And it seems that the crises are now ongoing. And, you know, with the deeper sense of urgency around global climate, uh, the global climate emergency, we've, we've uh, just last year began a, our most recent series, Rising Residencies. And we're encouraging artists um, to propose more active projects seeking intentionality and transformation for our species and the planet. We intentionally try to make these themes as broad as we can as containers for artists to come in with all different kinds of responses and projects. And I want to stress that we really uh, welcome artists of all disciplines. We've had writers and filmmakers and visual artists and scholars and just really anyone who can make a case for using the space. So the next thing I'd like to do is show you all uh, just a brief video. Um, we completed after with, with all the adaptations residents who were here from six weeks uh, in residence from 2017 to 2020. We invited them to answer a series of questions after their residencies and sort of like what, what, what has been your time like at Studio in the Woods and really what is the role of the artist during this time? And so uh, we'll play that now. deny you know that the, the fires are raging and the storms keep coming and the water is rising it's the role of the artist to connect all of these times of past and present how do we create sustainable futures or for future generations you know um in an intersectional kind of ways of looking at like our relationships to the earth to each other well, i'm excited about participating as an artist that healing that's conjuring and alchemizing old wounds and artists as creatures. Artists can be sort of midwives to welcome people into the fact that this crisis is, is very real. The work that I create so sort of addresses all the stuff that, that we humans have, have done to sort of be the cause of change in the environment. With indigenous people in Louisiana, part of our fundamental identity is the environment itself. And with that environment changing, trying to figure out how to maintain that identity. And to think back to where we're from, where we go, hope that someone could be touched, has a direct reaction with the project. Looking at how the landscape um, is constantly changing is, is kind of like foundational. We as humans have to kind of um, you know, come up with some new creative solutions to how to, to live with water and um, adapt to our changing climate. I think artists can ask different kinds of provoking questions. What are the ways that we're using art as a service to the planet, as a service to each other? And what is art? It's the exploration of the imagination. I think another role of the artist is to have a radical imagination, is to very bombastically imagine a different scenario for us and to project that scenario through our imagination and to actually build it for people to see. Art is one of the most powerful organizing tools that we have, one of the most powerful tools for change. Artists have a capacity to reach for what people's deepest wishes and dreams are. Being an artist feels like so much responsibility. We need to dig into our minds or bodies as dancers dig for elegance 
creation is part of adaptation. You do something, you experiment, and then you see if it works. It's a halfway between like the research process and the creative process. And also the collaboration with science. This is an amazing place that really gets it and knows that it's going to take a kind of multi-tiered, multidisciplinary approach to really change the way that we're engaging with our environment. All humans are obligated to give their, whatever their unique expertise and passions are to uh, the climate crisis. This is a multidisciplinary challenge. We all need to be learning each other's dialogues. We all need to be communicating in as many ways as we possibly can to make a difference. We've learned how to adapt in the most like dire circumstances, like even when it seems like there is no hope and there's no reason that we should be surviving, we see ourselves and we know ourselves as part of the land. So our freedom is interconnected and uh, we need each other. Yeah. <laughs>Thank you so much for showing that, uh, Kelsey. And uh, also, it reminds me of having pandemic hair while I was. <laughs> um, Amy, uh, Amy, I'm going to address this question towards you um, because uh, the adaptations residency. Many people spoke about, at least in that video, spoke about preserving things in the face of change. Uh, one of the things, just for example, that I worked on a lot there was my own uh, tribal language, Ishakoi, and I made the first Ishakoi film and a few publications that make use of the language. Um, what do you think is a, I mean, what do you think is really a thrust of what artists there have seen as worth saving? Or what do you think is worth saving, say, or your great grandchildren, what would be something you would want to have for them that were in danger of losing? And I'm, I'm also going to address that question uh, to Brendan and Sam. And uh, just what would you like to see them have in the future? I'm going to begin with you, Amy. You know, I've been sitting with that question of Maida's ever since the last, uh, I think it was on one of your slides, Maida, from the last presentation that, that you all hosted. And I've really been sitting with it. I mean, on one level, it's like parades and music and all the things that I love. Um, and then on another level, it's, I, I think, most precious is the gift that like arts and culture, one of the many gifts that arts and culture give to us, which is a sense of ourself and um, a sense of each other. And if we don't have that, wherever we go or whether we stay or however we are in the future, um, we're gonna be in trouble. And to me, having a sense of ourselves and each other and our collective power and wisdom is something that the arts can give us and which we very much need right now in this moment, but I sure don't want to lose it in the next set of generations either. So I guess that's my kind of more expansive answer besides all the things that I enjoy and love as a Louisianian. You're muted, Jeffrey. I'm terribly sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sam, do you want to have a shot at that uh, question as well? Thank you, Amy. You said Sam? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's also a, a very serious question. My wife and I just had our first child. And so, you know, there's a lot of time reflecting on even what I want my own son to see. <laughs> which as we start talking about climate change and land loss you know just casting 20 years in the future can be a scary uh, 
prospect, but thinking about, you know, a great grandchild, let's talk about a hundred years from now. I mean, I don't, to, I have to think about the connection I have with my own great grandparents in one way or the other, and the ways in which traditions have either been carried or not carried, uh, and how those connections have been, you know, kept, uh, and in some cases, you know, really not. So I, I do just, I hope for my great grandchildren or for those, that future generation, I hope that we can share some common language uh, and that I can even help be a good, you know, passer down of those things that have survived from my great grandparents, uh, which includes things like language, especially the French language in Acadiana, uh, dancing, partner dancing is just so important. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, please learn. Uh, <laughs> it's good for your soul. It's good for your psychology. Uh, if you know how to dance with somebody, you know how to dance, uh, you know, outside of physical movement too. A lot of great lessons there. Uh, but those are things that are just so interwoven with the, the culture in which I live uh, that have come through previous generations and really don't exist anywhere else in the same way that they do here. And I hope that the little fragments that we have remaining in the small communities we have that celebrate them, I hope we can steward those uh, in a way that's authentic and meaningful for our great grandchildren. Thank you for that, Sam. Uh, Brendan, I, I saved you for, uh, last in this because I've noticed that in your own artwork there is a tremendous push for various types of preservation uh, in a way that intersects between preservation of ideas and preservation of physical objects. Um, I was thinking about you in particular the other day in relation to this event because I was thinking about certain what are the oldest objects I own. You know, I have a, a corn sheller from my grandparents' farm from the 1920s. I have a 1903 photo of my great-great-grandparents. Um, but a lot of your work deals with uh, various types of preservation, and maybe this would be a good segue. I know you had some slides, and maybe you could talk um, maybe in detail about your own artistic practice based on those, and that'd be a way of talking about like what it is you think is particularly worthy of preservation, or what is the thrust of that in your work, if sure. uh, you don't mind. That would, be, that would be great. If you want to start the slides, that would be super. Um, well, just in general, like when, when I, I start thinking about culture, I think of the way that um, culture is shaped by you know, the environments and ecosystems and organisms. You know, the human cultures are, sh are, 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 are shaped and shape the, 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 the plant and, and fungal and, and microbial communities around them. But we're, 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 we're super interconnected. And as such, when I think about what I want, you know, great grandchildren or grandchildren, you know, people in the future to, to experience are some of the aspects of, of South Louisiana that are so incredibly special. Like I, I, I want, you know, great grandchildren to see monarch butterflies, <laughs> you know, like you know this this species that um, may disappear within you know a, a few decades if we're not careful, and because of changes to climate, but also changes uh, from agriculture and, and you know Cajun prairie. I want uh, I want future generations to be able to experience that and, and bottomland hardwood forest. Thinking about studio in the woods. <laughs> Um, migratory songbirds, uh, the three subspecies of alligator snapping turtles we have in Louisiana and nowhere else, <laughs> or the, the 77 endemic species in the Gulf of Mexico of fishes. These are fishes that are found nowhere else on the planet except for in the Gulf of Mexico. And anyway, I think about that in terms of, of human culture. And before I get really started, I, I'll share a story from um, this, this portable museum project. I was showing it in Point Ocean, and I'll show a slide in a minute. And I was talking to one of the, the elder fishermen there, and he was telling me when he was a boy, um, his father took him out and they caught a, um, a sawfish. Um, you know, this is one of these creatures with the, the, the bill that comes out with the spines on the side. They're kind of very flat. They almost look like uh, 
cross between a, a ray and a shark, but they have this very distinctive bill with spines on the side. And uh, he said his father, you know, they caught the fish, they brought it on board. It was this massive thing. And the whole time I'm thinking, this is crazy. You know, there's, there, there aren't sawfish in Buena and there aren't sawfish in the bayous. He's like, yeah, they were really common. And, uh, but the whole time I'm like, that's not possible. Like they're so, they're, at this point, they're endangered. They're extremely rare. I mean, they're found in a few spots in the Gulf of Mexico, they're protected. But the idea that they were there, I thought was completely, um, you know, something he was making up. And he said, when we brought it on board, it gave live birth and out came this sack in which this baby sawfish, you know, pushed its way out of. And that is exactly the way a sawfish gives live birth. And only somebody that saw that or a biologist would kind of know that detail. So it showed me that I was, I needed to listen better <laughs> uh, from elders and people that, that had experienced that land and, and learn and then think about that, like that story that he cannot share with his grandchildren. And, um, you know, how, how can we fix that? <laughs> how can we bring the sawfish back? And, and how can those stories come back? But anyhow, um, to talk a little bit about my work, Jeffrey, you said preservation. Um, this is probably a, a good work to, to, to start with uh, in that regard, dealing with um, specimen preservation. This, this, you know, really to me isn't um, about, it's a sculptural installation called Collapse. Um, to give you an idea, if you haven't seen it in person, um, it's, uh, a little over 400 jars with preserved specimens from the Gulf of Mexico following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, they are, they represent uh, a little over 370 species, which is a tiny, tiny little fragment of the amount of life that's actually found in the biodiversity as far as species. It's less than 3%. So if you imagine this, this installation is about a little over 12 feet tall by 15 by 15 feet wide. Um, if you had another 97 of these sitting in a space somewhere, that's what we know just currently about the, the amount of organisms in the Gulf of Mexico, but it's, you know, there's still so many things we don't know. There's so many species we're describing all the time. Um, so this was what I call a sculptural reaction. It was made, um, in collaboration with three other biologists. But uh, one of the things in, in science that is wonderful and limiting is science, of course, is based on um, factual discovery. So you build evidence. And so this was, this was just two years after the oil spill, um, the 2010 BP oil spill, which um, still remains the largest um, oil spill in history and certainly one of the largest environmental catastrophes in the history of the United States um, beyond you know, agriculture and, and the Europeans arriving. Um, so this being number three, the, the amount of oil that spilled into the Gulf, uh, we estimate to be over 200 million gallons. Um, half of that oil we believe remains in the Gulf of Mexico. We're not sure. It's mixed in with sediment. A decision was made to use chemical dispersants called Corexit. And what they did is they molecularly, they broke the oil you know, from it floating at the surface. It was broken apart, um, molecularly made heavier so that it would sink. And the problem is was when it was sinking, then with the Gulf Stream, it was really spreading all over the place. So we're, we're not really sure how, it's hard to gauge how widespread this bill was. And because of the use of dispersants, uh, it made the oil much more toxic um, and harder to break down. Naturally, in the Gulf of Mexico, you have microorganisms that eat oil. I mean, the, the Gulf of Mexico is filled, certain areas are filled with oil, so there's always seeps. And naturally, you have microorganisms that break them down. However, when you exit it, it moves that process. So then one of the things that uh, the other biologists and I were afraid of is what happens when that now more toxic oil enters the food chain. And that's how this, um, this piece really was created. So on one hand, it was about speculating and thinking about um, how this oil could impact various levels of the food chain. At the same time, the work really was, if we wanna to go to the next slide, it was intended as a, as a kind of memorial 
as you can see, um, the way that everything was stacked, it was this giant pyramid um, where you couldn't really see, you could see the first like two or three layers of jars, um, but each one of the specimens, literally I tried to curate. So you can see they're, they're kind of placed, these are actually stitched onto glass um, inside of the jar, inside of liquid. So you're not just seeing something sitting on the bottom. So it's something to pull your eye more towards the center. Um, and again, this was not meant to be didactic. It wasn't meant to be a scientific display. It was meant to really uh, be a memorial, but also when people start to look at it, to be amazed <laughs> and hopefully awe-inspiring, making them think about just you know how much diversity there is in the Gulf. Because most of us, when we think of the Gulf of Mexico, we think the water's really muddy or it's really contaminated. Um, and you know we think of shrimp and redfish and oysters, but we don't think of all that other diversity. And you know, all of those things are true. It is there are areas that are heavily polluted. There are areas that are, you know, really, really set, you know, have a lot of turbidity. Uh, however, um, you know, all the seafood that we're 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 gathering, that's just a byproduct of of this incredibly resilient and productive, uh, massive environment. So there's still so much that we don't understand that. I was hoping that in a way this could create this kind of dialogue or, or continued interest in um, you know, wanting to learn more. And then hopefully from that, that desire to want to learn more into trying to protect what we know is there and also encourage people to, to continue to push for understanding the impact of the oil spill and, and trying to understand um, how we can prevent this from happening in the future. So collapse uh, is gonna be shown um, at the Acadiana Center for the Arts this fall, if you have an opportunity to come to Lafayette and visit to see it. And then I think we're gonna to try to show it uh, next spring in New Orleans with Antenna. Um, so I've always wanted to bring it to Louisiana. That's been a dream. It's traveled um, since 2012, um, literally all over the country, but it's never, um, it's never been in Louisiana and it's finally time that it comes home. So next slide, please. Uh, so I had mentioned this, this portable museum. This was, so my family and I moved from New York City to uh, South Louisiana to Arneville in 2016. And I began, uh, my background I should say is I am an amphibian biologist working in the fish lab at LSU and now starting to do fish work uh, with Tulane. And um, so I'm really kind of like a frog out of water or frog in salt, I don't know, it's a bad joke, but Amphibians aren't normally in salt water, so I'm still trying to learn after um, living here for five years. But one of the things that I, I, I learned during Collapse is um, I met so many folks between 2010 and 11 and 12 trying to do volunteer work to rescue birds and, and inevitably um, collected just hundreds of specimens, but I, I met just incredible people in Plaquemines Parish and Grand Isle and, and later in Acadiana and just really fell in love with the community uh, so much so that, um, you know, my family and I moved down here in, in 2016. And one of the first things I wanted to do is, is try to do outreach with these communities instead of bringing them to go see an installation like Collapse to bring a museum to them where they're living, whether it's Point Ocean or whether it's Homa or whether it's in Venice or Phoenix, um, uh, I was really interested in working with um, rural and isolated communities. So Crude Life started with a scientific study um, at LSU with Prosanta Chakrabarty, was the, the lead biologist on that, um, the curator of ichthyology at the Museum of Natural Science at LSU, myself and a couple of other folks. And we wanted to see out of those, those fishes, the endemic fishes in the Gulf of Mexico, which ones have been reported since the 2010 spill. So there are a couple of online databases that you can Google and or you can look at these data sets to see which specimens have been collected in natural history collections. And we realized that um, there were 14 species that have been missing of those endemics since um, 2010. So literally we created, working with a whole team of, of great artists and other scientists, we created this portable museum and started bringing it to uh, fisher folk communities and blessing of the fleet ceremonies and uh, 
uh, farmers markets and marinas and um, and made these wanted posters, which you can kind of see in the distance behind some of the specimens. And it had those missing species on it and tried to work with community members to find them. And then also work with community members to, to contribute to the museum if they wanted to. Um, and it was really great. We ended up finding one of the one of the missing species on one of the field trips, which was which was really rewarding. And uh, we want to go to the next one. Kind of continuing in that spirit, um, working with Studio in the Woods and Tulane University, um, and specifically to Plaquemines Parish. Uh, over the next couple of years, I'm I'm continuing this search for missing species, and the the thing is. Out of those 77 endemics in the Gulf of Mexico, there are about half of them we don't know anything about. <laughs> you know, they were collected once in a shrimp net um, off of Grand Isle, or somebody, you know, found one in Pensacola Beach and, and they managed to save it, you know, and preserve it. And it ended up at the Smithsonian or Tulane or somewhere. And uh, but we know very little about the natural history of these species. We know very little about, you know, what they need as far as ecosystems or how they fit in these ecosystems and environment. Um, so working again with fisher folk and, and coastal communities, what I really want to try to do, and, and specifically communities that are at risk of what I call cultural extinction, uh, I want to use the looking for the fish as a metaphor for working together to try to go out and and look for these missing species, but also think about ways that we can adapt and, and try to think of art and science projects that may help us become a little bit more resilient and create through art. Uh, I love Sam and, and Maida, what you were saying, the way that art um, you know, has a way of reaching people in a really unique way. And uh, Sam, how you said that uh, to, to connect it, art has a way to connect at a human scale. I really believe that. So these portraits that I'm making are made out of oil. So it's a deep water horizon oil mixed with um, the Taylor oil spill, which is an ongoing spill that's been ongoing since 2004. It's like, you know, probably the second largest spill in, in human history, as far as we know, that nobody talks about. Um, this is also the, the Taylor energy spill is in Southeast, it's just out of Plaquemines Parish, as was Deepwater Horizon. So trying to work with oil field workers um, and actually have them do some drawings and paintings like this as well. Uh, so this is, this is one of the missing fish. This is a portrait um, of one of the missing fish. Um, it's called a high flin binny. It hasn't been seen in a little over two decades. So uh, this will be a, an ongoing project in Plaquemines Parish and, and the idea being that we'll do field trips uh, at the, the Suckus field collection or the Suckus fish collection, which is the second largest preserved fish collection on the planet outside of the Smithsonian, which is in Belle Chase. And we'll actually try to get oil field workers and fisher folk to come. And I'm going to do drawing classes with them, but then I'm going to go out with them um, and hopefully learn about the environmental changes that they're seeing try to think of, of creative ways we can catalog that, but really try to try to build resilience in ways that we're taking those stories and their art and bringing it outside um, of Plaquemines Parish, but also trying to get communities that live next to each other to communicate more because culturally they're very isolated. And the more that you can build these ties with these communities, uh, interweaving them through art or through si citizen science, um, just ways to communicate, the, the more resilient they'll be and hopefully they can adapt to these, you know, these changes that we're seeing. Um, so next slide, please. And in thinking along those lines about adaptation and changes and things we can do, this is um, when we moved to South Louisiana, uh, we ended up, my family and I, um, my wife and our two little kids, there was only one at that point, um, we bought nine acres of soybean fields with a little tiny broken house. <laughs> so the little broken house has been fixed a little bit, but the soy fields, we started to replant um, and re-nature, if you will. So we took all the soybeans out and tried to start Im immediately planting um, di different clovers and, and plants that would then create a cover crop, but could actually remove some of the, the pesticides from the soil 
and break them down in an attempt to kind of create a uh, nature reserve and eco campus, what we call a Tilia de la Nature. And so we've been working with um, Restoring Cajun Prairie. I, I talked about how I hope this will be around in future generations. We're at about 22 feet above sea level. So we'll see how long we last. Um, but we've done a lot of restoration. So now there's a wetland in the back. Um, we do community programming where we invite community uh, youth to come in. We do experiential art and science and environmental education. And uh, we have, we're working on building trails. Uh, and I would say Studio in the Woods is one of the inspirations, certainly, and, and, uh, uh, and hopefully a future partner, as is the ACA. Um, and we do community festivals as well. So we do this great thing called the Halloween Art and Nature Festival, um, where we get about 25 organizations. We invite artists and scientists and naturalists and conservation people and oil and gas people and, and shrimpers, and they all come together and we celebrate uh, the rich culture that we have. And we tell stories to each other and we go on haunted hay rides and we learn from each other. And it's a day long event um, that's really celebrating the special nature of South Louisiana. And when I mean nature, I mean not only the, the, the natural history and the, the ecosystems, but again, the cultures that, that drive those ecosystems and have been driven by those ecosystems. So we're gro we've grown a little bit. We're up to about 25 acres, thanks to the support of, of patrons. And, and I invite you all to come out. Uh, the hope is that uh, as we continue to grow, um, we'll hopefully have some dormitory sites and other sites where we can host artists and residents and scientists in residence, but also importantly, I think in times of emergency, um, if certain areas are flooded, maybe people can come and stay, <laughs> you know, or get out of the way of the storm um, if possible. So we hope to be able to, to host that in the future. Uh, the other thing that I think we should mention um, that I wanna mention is we're exploring, you know, we're talking about um, loss of culture because of climate, uh, we're trying to push back the other way too. We're really interested in how you can, I'm really interested in how you can recreate habitat, re, uh, re-nature to help sequester carbon, to help do our part to actually slow climate change and to make sure that you have ecosystems that can withstand heavier storms. So we're looking at the way prairie grasses and can sequester carbon and, and thinking about like how, uh, really uh, as individuals, what kind of difference we can make to help terraform in the other direction instead of just uh, giving up. <laughs> you know, I do believe that we're gonna have to, many parts of our state, we're gonna have to retreat. But I also believe that there's a lot of restoration that we can do, which can make a difference. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave with that. Thank you uh, very much uh, for showing that, Brendan. I you know, you uh, gave me your book last time I saw you, and I have looked at it many, many times. So it's just nice to hear you talk about that. Uh, one of the things uh, while you were talking about, I was thinking about this um, in my own work, uh, you know, dealing with uh, tribal cultural preservation of the Atakapai Ishak Nation, of which I remember, you know, I just remember uh, standing on a shell midden in Vermilion Parish, uh, a place called Four Mile Cutoff, and, you know, that there's a ship channel that runs straight through the middle of this ancient midden that's covered in pottery sh shards and everything and it's a ship channel for to take people to the gulf of mexico and for all i know my own father rode on it at some point my father was a retired oil field worker the chief of our tribe is a retired oil field worker uh, a lot of members of our tribe are oil field workers um, and a lot of my friends around uh, the atacapa district which i will always call acadiana um, so when, you know, and I was also thinking about Amy uh, talking about how there's been an increase in number of people seeking residencies. I know that grants have become more competitive. I've been lucky enough, not knock on wood, to get a good bit of grant funding this year, uh, but they are seeing more and more applicants. And there is a crunch of art fund, arts funding, it seems. At the same time, there are, pe there are people who are getting involved in arts funding as a way of sort of deflecting criticism in some way. Uh, a few years ago, Mel Evans published Art Wash, which was a landmark book about the way the petroleum industry had attempted to steer arts funding in Britain uh, in order to influence arts funding to not be steered towards art about climate change. Uh, 
I know a lot of people in Louisiana work in the petroleum industry. Uh, I've written about my own uh, ambiguity about, uh, about that. Uh, have you noticed anything in Louisiana? Like what is the relationship between the, politi uh, the very politically prominent petroleum industry to uh, arts fundings and arts discussions about this issue? If you've encountered any sort of pushback or have any thoughts about that? Jeffrey, quick pushback. Acadiana is a tack of all country and Ishak and Chittimacha and Opelousas, a little bit up there in the north. Uh, Bob, you're not my favorite person, I want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I mean, I'll, I'll speak on my side, but I'd love to hear Aime especially <laughs> talk on this subject. Uh, you know, in Acadiana, uh, there's you know, yeah, a huge uh, basis of workers, workforce uh, that, that, you know, earned a living and built wealth and generational wealth uh, in the oil and gas industries and less and less so now as well. And I think that sense of scarcity and desperation also makes it even more of a, uh, you know, tighter cling in some ways, as opposed to what I would hope is let it go. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to, you know, funders and institutional funders, you know, I get, I have the benefit being outside of New Orleans of getting to look over at those big oil and gas funders that support the arts extremely heavily, like for example, the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation, uh, directly connected to, you know, funded by the, uh, what is it called? Uh, Brandon, you gotta help me out. Taylor Oil Spill. Yes, the Taylor Oil Spill. Uh, you know, you, the, you Google the Taylor name and what comes up is not the Taylor Oil Spill, but it is the $7.5 million they gave to the Smithsonian. Uh, so I think it's been, you know, whether that's genuine philanthropy or whether that's effective public relations, I really, I have no way of knowing specifically, but I see the result. And I know that we don't have that discussion uh, in, in the cultural spaces and in, the, in some spaces like um, Press Street Antenna Gallery, you know, with Fossil Free Fest, uh, which has hosted that, you know, that's an, that still is an outsider art space. It is not the Contemporary Arts Center. It's not the New Orleans Museum of Art. It's not one of the institutions that would, would not uh, host an event like that probably because they are institutionally tied to the Hellas Family Foundation, aka Hellas Oil and Gas. Uh, and, and they, you know, th those dollars are substantial. And as somebody who's the executive director of an organization and, you know, is responsible for staff members whose salaries I pay and who then support their families, I get it. I sympathize completely, which is why being outside of that area, I know that those organizations aren't going to give me money anyway, so I'm very happy to criticize them. <laughs> uh, Amy? Yeah. <laughs> I said it so you don't have to, all right? <laughs> no, I so much want to, of course. Um, my dad, too, worked in the oil industry. Um, and... You know, I, I mean, obviously we look at so many things. It's Hellas, it's Shell, the Jazz and Heritage Foundation, you know, that Jazz and Heritage Festival is funded by Shell and, and you know, they, to the degree that, that it's the Shell Jazz and Heritage Foundation fe Festival. I mean, it's not, it's not even that they're just giving the money to quietly support arts and culture. It's that they're giving money to brand very specifically um, and link themselves with these large, you know, cultural, um, treasures. And I, I was really inspired, of course, Fossil Free Fest is just such a brilliant, um, uh, I, I look forward to its return that, that you mentioned, Sam, that, that is, um, uh, put out by, you know, the antenna, um, hosts, and there, um, it was the brainchild of uh, if probably a few people, but certainly Imani Brown, who is a really brilliant artist and thinker who's doing a lot of research right now. Um, she's in London, um, 
getting a degree and I'm not, don't, couldn't name it exactly. Maybe someone could put it in the chat, but, or link to her website, but she's really looking, she's done a lot of work at tracing the lines back, like where are, what, exposing what is so unexposed in our state, the degree to which the oil industry subsidizes um, so much of what is going on. And, you know, I think it's, I was looking at one of these questions about, you know, if, if Louisiana becomes uninhabitable in three genera generations, what should we be doing now? Well, I'm not, I don't want to leave before the oil industries do. They need to go first and then we can decide whether we're leaving. And so, yeah, that's just, just you know, it, but it is a really hard, if it, you know, as you said, Sam, we run an organization, there's things that you want to do and that wouldn't happen otherwise if, if you didn't have these resources and it's, it's hard, the system's kind of broken. Um, I personally love getting funding from the National Endowment for the Arts and from the Louisiana Division of the Arts because I see those as, you know, um, money that's been, you know, that juries, it, it's peer selected and peered and the money is from our tax dollars. And I, I just, otherwise the system is, is challenged and, and kind of broken. And so how do we move forward in that system? And how do we move forward with everybody? You know, I'm not interested in alienating people, but I think we need to, um, how, do you, how do you critique something and then take money from it as well? It's, it's, it's a really uh, suspicious and challenging place. We find ourselves here in Louisiana. And again, I wanna encourage us to sort of take like, what, what can we show the rest of the world around this? You know, uh, oil is so important here in Louisiana, uh, but is it really? Is it really our most important asset? No. So I'll just make I'll say it now. <laughs> because you're obviously in uh, hardwood bottomland, it, you know, so much of the wetlands and those uh, bottomland forests are specifically decimated through saltwater intrusion because of the creation of, you know, pipeline canals that were never backfilled, that were never, you know, whatever, uh, mitigated after the fact in the way that they might have been intended to be, but certainly nothing was done with it. So, you know, you know, you, you look under the rug any direction and, you know, any level, I'm sure any type of major industry will have ecological impacts, period. Ours is the oil and gas industry, <laughs> but uh, what's, you know, it is an industry that is fading from this day, uh, period. It's, it's just a fact uh, through, through the state of the, you know, of Louisiana laws of, you know, how lawsuits have worked out. The oil and gas industry is departing from the state uh, and we may be continuing to participate in that industry in some ways for time to come, but also those, those you know, institutional dollars that tie up the voices of some of our real cultural leaders, those dollars are gonna dry up as well. Uh, they may eventually become purely family foundation dollars, in which case, you know, like the Ford Foundation as a separate entity from the Ford Automotive Company, uh, the Ford Foundation has its own separate mission that is more, uh, you know, seeking of equity and seeking <laughs> to uplift voices and not suppress them. Maybe that will happen. Thank you for those very uh, candid answers and they do speak to like a real tension. Um, I know that I'm not the anti-oil worker. I mean, again, my father was an oil worker, chief of our tribe was an oil worker. Many of my dearest friends and family are oil workers. Um, and then also as an artist though, you have to tell the truth about what you're seeing or about what has happened, etc. And I think those two things are reconcilable. It just, it, 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 means a commitment to understanding people on all sides of a thing and what are their pressures and what are the things that motivate them. And um, I think that's a really important thing. Um, speaking of people, and this is like a last sort of big question for me, and I'd like to receive some uh, questions in the chat. And Meyer, I think your question was answered in the chat by Cami Hill Pruitt. Uh, but I'm gonna ask uh, because some, you've mentioned this uh, in various ways. How does your work specifically 
relate to communities that seem to be bearing the brunt of the impact of climate change. The impacts of climate change are not distributed evenly. And this has been written about extensively, but also many times in Louisiana, the people who feel the brunt of climate change, either through land loss, through increased extreme weather, for example, or living in parts of cities that happen to flood a good bit, uh, seem to be disproportionately uh, people who are just generally disenfranchised in our society. How does your work address those communities in particular? Well, I can jump in. Um, in some ways, we're not, I feel like we're not addressing, uh, relating to those communities enough. Um, I mean, there's, but then it's all in some sense a matter of degrees, right? I mean, um, New Orleans itself is, um, is in a way endangered. And so the communities in New Orleans are endangered. And of course there are, um, you know, the artists that are here trying to do work um, are, are struggling. And so we do, I mean, kind of directly to answer your question, we do for every call that we do, um, we make sure that um, we prioritize native and black uh, artists, other artists of color in, um, in reaching out to make sure those artists apply and making sure those artists are on our jury and making sure those artists um, are uh, equitably um, part of the selection process um, as a response to COVID. And what we saw is just such, you know, how COVID just um, laid bare such gross inequities that have existed for centuries, right? Um, we responded to that by forming a, or putting together a residency program called Relief Residencies for Black and Indigenous and other artists of color locally um, to just give them stipend and retreat in our woods to work on whatever it is they were working on. Um, so we tried to answer that you know, to res respond to that. But then at the end of the day, they're just, I know there's so many artists that we aren't reaching and really who are like much more, I mean, New Orleans is considered a frontline community when you think of an, the, the nation, but um, we're not a frontline community here in South Louisiana. And so, you know, we're always um, looking for ways to engage in those communities. And this is a very open invitation to do that. I'm using this platform to do that. If you are um, have a project or an idea or wanna either apply for a residency or talk about doing some kind of special collaboration or, or you know, at some point in the future is looking at um, or partnering with communities. Um, we bring artists from different parts of the country and the world who are really interested in engaging um, in a respectful and sustainable way with, with our communities. So. That's what we try to do, and hopefully we get better and better at it. Thank you for that, Amy. Sam, um, you've touched on it a bit, but um, I'd like to hear you talk about it a bit. Well, I think it's you know the the organizational purpose for Acadiana Center for the Arts is to be the cultural development agency, kind of the responsible party for <laughs> the cultural sector in Acadiana. And that runs from, uh, you know, coastal communities up to uh, Brandon's neck of the woods or neck of the prairie. Uh, to me, there's a, you know, across that geography, there's a lot of uh, particular different issues. And we're gonna think about, I think what, what Meta has really talked about in the course of the Bayou Culture Collaborative uh, and, and teased out the idea of the, the movements of families uh, along geographies and along watersheds, uh, you know, as, as lower, uh, lower latitude communities become unlivable by the 
definitions of, you know, the average person, they'll move north. And, you know, it's our job to concern ourselves with the people who are having to move and the communities that are receiving them. And it's an extremely complex issue, uh, but we'll be in the conversation. Uh, we don't have a solution, but we'll be there. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm also thinking about the, uh, maybe kind of the psychological or, uh, or community uh, geography too, which is we, in a lot of these groups that we're talking, uh, we're talking in insular ways. We're speaking to one another. Uh, we're speaking to the people who maybe are already on this Zoom call or we're on the last one as well. And I think that's good because we need to do that to you know, get our ideas straight and come up with actually good thoughts uh, and have a critical process. You know, how do you critique and take money? <laughs> that's that's a criticism we need to uh, really continue to talk about. But uh, but also, if we're only speaking to one another and not to the communities in which we live in a way that's accessible, uh, then we'll very quickly speak ourselves into complete irrelevance. Uh, you know, I I think there's. Some interesting thoughts. I don't really have a more developed idea about it, but there are interesting thoughts about preservation versus conservation. Obviously, in a lot of uh, land and wildlife, you know, Louisiana is a big conservationist place because it means you still get to hunt, uh, <laughs> as opposed to preservationist, which is more of the of national park route, which means the land be as untouched as possible, uh, except maybe for uh, interpretation. Uh, but they're different, they're different approaches. And uh, I'm sorry, I totally forgot what your real question was. You know, for someone who says he has undeveloped ideas, you sure say some good stuff. <laughs> like, I'm, uh, I'm not sure exactly what I asked, but that was a very interesting answer, uh, especially that tension between conservation and preservation, which is, uh, yeah, and then the issue of sustainability is, uh, comes in there. Um, Joni Hammonds, who was on the Zoom, asked an interesting question, which all these statements seem to relate to, and I'm going to read it. How can we add arts and culture as a communications tool in the toolbox to augment the state's ongoing initiatives related to climate change and adaptation, such as task, force, task forces, et cetera? And expand the statewide conversation from its current focus on economic impacts and larger industrial transitions. Um, I'm gonna say something a little bit, but I think it's the first question I'm gonna to try to answer a little bit is that one of the things I really learned uh, a lot of lately is how much of an economic impact the arts have. It is a tremendous investment anytime arts are invested in. It pays off time and time again. It makes communities vibrant. It makes communities live and it is a great invest investment. Uh, but I'm going to turn that question over uh, first to Brandon and then the other two of you. And this is a great question. Thank you for asking it, Joni. Um, well, j just, to, just to jump in for a second, I had to Google it. So 26% of the, the uh, overall funding in Louisiana comes from oil. So 26%. That's our, that's our whole economy, right? So um, oil doesn't necessarily uh, fund all of Louisiana all that much, but they certainly have a lot of lobbying presence, right? So agriculture is actually the biggest one. Um, but yes, as you say, like arts having an economic impact, I and mean, this has been this huge push for creative placemaking because we've seen in, over and over again, it's, it's offering new possibilities for communities that have, have undergone um, decline, you know, depending on wherever that is in the world. It could be Liverpool, it could be um, Arneville for that matter. Uh, so thinking of ways that I think um, one of the immediate things we could talk about is the relationship between uh, arts and culture and tourism. Right? I mean, we live in a very special part of the universe because of the rich cultural history we have here. Um, regardless of the climate 
impacts we're, we're having, this could be another very, very relevant source of income, I believe. Ecotourism could be enormous here. It's bizarre. We have more protected land. Now, given it's conservation, it's not preservation sand, but we have more protected land in Louisiana than Costa Rica. So Costa Rica makes billions each year off of ecotourism. We make very, very little because we don't market what we have, for one thing. Secondly, the arts as part of that would just be very complimentary and, and, and talking about how you know, people already realize the, the, the food culture of, of Louisiana, they realize Cajun country, you know, but ways to tie this in uh, so that you're attracting people that aren't just coming to go to Bourbon Street, but ways we could, you know, really sell like how rich the different areas of our state are. And I think, um, you know, that, that would be an immediate way that we could try to support um, arts and how they could further economic develop, but also move away from the same conversation about who's funding everything all the time, that 26%. Like we, we realize that we have to move past this <laughs> anyway. So it's just another opportunity, I think, that could be tapped into. Amen. Thanks, Brandon. That was great to get those um, those statistics. I, you know, my first thought. I love this question because, right? It's how do we um, how do we be in conversation and community together around? I mean, we have to, right? We have to be together in any of these conversations. And my my first thought is to make sure that there are artists at some of these tables. Um, yeah. You know, and even if it's not clear what the what the reason for the artist is, you know, it's like the conversation will go better if there's a poet in the room, if there's a sculptor in the room, if there's a, you know, whatever, um, to uh, reflect back, to reframe, to be, you know, to, to, to just be, have seats at the table uh, because decisions are, um, you know, there are conversations happening, there are decisions being made where there aren't artists at the table. And so I think that, that the, to, uh, how that happens could be really interesting to figure out and how those artists are selected and what support they have to be there. Um, and what comes out of that are, could be really interesting things to explore, but just getting, getting them in the room would be my first and highest answer to that. Thank you for that, Amy. That is such an important point, um, just getting the people in the room. I find that, you know, uh, Brandon, I'm, I don't know if you agree with this, but uh, I seem to think you do in your practice is just that practicing artists, really, we the things we make art about, if they have any kind of social issue, we usually spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about it, like reading about it, researching it. And I think artists often have an interesting take on something or maybe you might notice something others have not noticed. And that's an important point. Um, Sam, you also work with um, government agencies, uh, or at least some of the time, at least. Um, what is your take on that? Right, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, so also, yeah, I'll chime in. Great question. Uh, two answers to it. Uh, the, the first and simplest answer is, I think when we talk about working with other sectors and agencies, we really need to know what language they speak. That's kind of when I think about insularity in our arts community, we're, we're good at speaking to one another and we're good at teasing and attacking issues and that's great. Uh, but when we're speaking to say, you know, the planning commission, we, we need to understand them as, uh, you know, as a type of audience in some way, you know, uh, they have their own language, they have their own goals, they have their own uh, skills and things they bring to the table and they have gaps in all of that as well. And so I think it's to be able to understand that and really find out how we fit in the picture is a task and it's, it's a, you know, it's a big task. Uh, fortunately, there are actually, you know, the, the best thing to do, I think, and Jody may agree with me, uh, you know, is if you want to convince the planner uh, that you're a part of their plan, you know, put it in writing <laughs> or go to a, a previous plan and say, well, in this previous plan, 
uh, on page 163 of the regional adaptation strategy, uh, you know, subcategory B3, it says support co healthy communities, regional culture and recreational access to nature. So we need to do that as a part of the watershed initiative, as a part of these uh, strategies that many of which are following from previous work done. Uh, you know, all of that work, if it's done well, as some of it has really been, does already begin to approach cultural issues. Do they understand the cultural issues? No. <laughs> uh, do we? Sometimes. Uh, but I think, yeah, it's, you know, literally in the LA Safe final strategy document, there is a section on cultural recommendations and it's on page 163. Uh, and I think that's a, the kind of thing that can be, you know, brought around and used to the benefit of everybody, uh, but to the benefit of this type of work, uh, because it might also, when we talk about funding to uh, Jonathan Foray's point, you know, bring those dollars into this uh, sector that aren't coming from oil and gas, but are public dollars that are taxpayer dollars uh, that can help elevate and fund this type of work. Uh, and, and it, you know, it's already ostensibly written into the plan. Is it written into the budget is the other question. Uh, so when we get $50 billion or whatever number for, you know, master planning the Gulf Coast uh, and trying to, you know, shovel buckets of water out of uh, whatever, uh, you name it. <laughs> which, which by you, Jonathan. Uh, that, that you know, we're, we're at that table for those conversations. Just, just a brief story, and this is just to demonstrate how we're really not doing it. Uh, but I know from conversations with uh, Susanna, who's the new executive director of the Louisiana Division of the Arts, uh, and Maida and Kelsey Spalls, uh, that that's, a, that's in the, you know, the target is to bring uh, cultural representation, artists, organizers to the table for those especially statewide conversations. In, in the course of this past year through the pandemic, you know, there were many of these state commissions, et cetera, that were formed, that were having discussions about, you know, community development, about tourism, about entertainment, about you name it, uh, economic development. And on exactly none of those statewide committees was there any representation from, you know, a, an artist the, or the owner of a bar or, you know, non multi mega mega million restaurant chain. Uh, it's very little like cultural representation in the sense of people who are actually living and doing the work. Uh, so that is a task. But I think it's it's a big present task. And fortunately, I think we have some alignment in the uh, cultural organizers and leadership to to get that done. Or just um, just for a second, Sam, I wanted to add to that just for a second. There's a lot of precedence for this kind of activity outside of Louisiana, especially in in Europe. And I think I saw Patricia Watts on here somewhere earlier from Eco Art Space. So like in the eco arts community or environmental arts community for the past 50 years, people like Helena Newton Harrison have been working with city planners to adapt to climate change even back in the 70s. So they've, um, we can do it. <laughs> There's, it, you know, it's like what you're saying, Jeffrey, it's about doing this research and looking at precedence of the way it's taken place in other areas effectively and then try to model that for what we have here and places like the Netherlands. I mean, they've been living with water for, you know, since the Netherlands became the Netherlands, right? So they have a history of working with artists to deal with communities there and actually do restoration projects, remediation projects. And um, so I think that would be a great other meeting, Susanna, if you're listening. Let's let's sit at the table and, and, and come up with ideas. Thank you for the Great answer, Brandon. I also like to point out, since you mentioned the Netherlands, that our indigenous nations along the coast of Louisiana have dealt with the Gulf of Mexico and its vicissitudes for the past several thousand years. And 
Um, the other day I saw a supposed new initiative for shoring up the Gulf by recycling oyster shells. And it's like, and I thought, well, I'm glad that y'all have caught up with us for this thing we've been doing for the last 10,000 years on the coast. We took a couple hundred year break and maybe there are other things that we are doing that you can catch up with too. Uh, that would be nice. Uh, all right, we're almost out of time. It's 4.22 and we have till 4.30. So what I would like to do, I'm gonna ask y'all a question and I would like quick answers. And that question is this, often scholars who work with climate change speak of a certain sense of urgency. Um, what should we be doing right now if Louisiana say, or the coast of Louisiana, not all of Louisiana, but certain of our cherished coastal spots might become uninhabitable within three generations? What do you think we should be doing now to address that in short, Short answer, I'm gonna start with you, Amy. Anything and everything we can think of to do right now. It's that, it's actually that urgent and, um, and it very much includes all kinds of work around. Sorry, I'm gonna just jump, say a little bit more, which it includes, you know, the work of, you know, anti-racist work, um, bringing indigenous communities to the center. The, the, this type of work, all this type of work that um, is how it's going to help us progress and solve the solution and all the things we haven't done or thought of yet. So all of our resources, um, I would posit, need to be directed here. Thank you, Amy. Sam, uh, quick answer. Everyone should find out who is on the Senate Appropriations Committee or the House Finance Committee, or it's the other way around. Uh, select one of those members, preferably somebody in their region generally, and work over the next six months to take them to lunch and then explain to them why you give a damn about this. I think that'd be the most effective thing anybody could do. I love that answer. Uh... And Brendan, quickly uh, answer the question, if Louisiana, parts of Louisiana might become uninhabitable in three generations, say the next 70, 80 years, what should we be doing right now? Remediation, we know remediation works, we know conservation works, we know diversions work, we know there's, there's science there, we have to mobilize, get the funding in place, prioritize the areas that we can say, look at the areas that we can't and work with the communities located in all those areas and try to collectively adapt. Thank you very much, Brendan. And thank you for all of you panelists. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. You have so many fascinating ideas and Maida, uh, as the host of this meeting, I would like for you to give us a few words to close out. Thank you so much for attending to all of you and for your questions. Thank you. This was a fabulous panel and it, it uh, met all my expectations and more. Um, it is part of a continuing conversation of, as I've said in other settings, that we don't necessarily have answers, but together we can move towards them. I think the most important thing is for the arts and culture communities to become part of the community resilience conversation. That is the phrase that they recognize. <laughs> it's, it's becoming part of the community resilience conversation. And at this point, we basically are hardly there. They've started noticing some of the things that we've been doing, but there's so much more as we are. We're really not at the table hardly. Um, and so part of the goals of the Bayou Culture Collaborative is at least to get to the table. Um, we, were, are, we recorded this, it will be posted online in the next few weeks. Um, but if you don't know, you can save a chat if you want these links sooner. Um, if you look over in the chat at the bottom, there are three little dots where type a message here, uh, you can save the, your chat um, and not have to wait for it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting links that people added in addition to ours. If you want to, uh, at the very beginning, and I think some second place is how to stay in contact. If you're not getting messages through constant contact from the Division of the Arts, um, I encourage you to go to our homepage and sign up for the various lists. There are quite a number of them. And I have a feeling a lot of you would be interested in, in 
getting some of the messages that we send out. Um, so um, thank you for coming. Uh, I will stick around for a little while in case people have questions or need, you know, trying to save the chat.